Some 600 undersea cables are the only thing that keep the internet glued together. They connect land masses by crossing international waters, and this makes protecting them nearly impossible. There are three big vulnerabilities to which they are exposed, the simplest of which is cutting them. Another one is espionage. There might currently be one multi-billion dollar entity with the ability to spy on up to 25% of all undersea cables. Government agencies and malicious organizations around our interconnected globe have each come up with their own attack ideas in a dark and twisted spy game. And if you think that satellites could save us, you are sorely mistaken. Now imagine an international espionage operation being the reason why your gooning session is cut short. August 18th, 1858. A fire breaks out in New York City's town hall. The reason? Dozens of people celebrating a bit too hard for the first ever telegraph communication between New York and London. Just a few hours prior, the last few kilometers of an undersea cable connecting London to New York had been laid. This was the cable's route, chosen after carefully considering several possible paths. Directors of Atlantic Telegraph Company, Great Britain, to directors in America. Europe and America are united by telegraph. Glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. This single event has been deemed to be responsible for up to 8% of all global exports in the following years. In a world with only a handful of undersea cables, you might think that cutting a bunch of them could have some serious consequences. World War I, a few decades after the first New York to London line, was the first time countries consistently attacked each other's cables. German and British armies did it to force their enemies to reroute their communications either through tapped wires or to have them fall back to radio communication, which was a lot easier to intercept. The British, in particular, had a widespread network called the All Red Line. It connected the entirety of the British Empire, and they even annexed one small island in the middle of the ocean to ensure that every single landing spot of this network was on British soil. That's so paranoid! Everyone was about cables! And by the way, in the past 80 years, we haven't come up with an agreement on how to treat people or organizations that cut cables. But, but more on that later. The cable cutting strategy would not yield the same disruptive results today, right? After all, when you have 600 plus cables, you probably have some degree of redundancy. When a street is closed to do maintenance work, people don't just get stranded, they find alternative routes, even if they might be a little longer. But some roads might be a lot more important than others, and blocking them might cause some issues. <laughs> In 2008, there were only three cables crossing the Suez Canal, and they connected two pretty big regions. The cables were involved in an accident, or maybe a malicious action, but we'll never know for sure because it's nearly impossible to determine if a cutting is accidental or intentional, and I'll tell you why later. Two of the three cables were cut. Egypt lost 70% of its internet capacity, and India lost half of its capacity to communicate with Western countries. But why would anyone ever want to cut those cables? Well, the undersea network initially relied on electric cables, just a bunch of really really long copper wires traveling through the ocean floor. They were really hard to set up and had abysmal communication speeds, primarily due to the signal getting corrupted over longer distances. This phenomenon was later described by the telegrapher's equations. My skull is actually filled with salt water, so I can't really explain this to you because I don't understand them. But nowadays, we use fiber optic cables, much much faster and so much more tolerant to signal disruption over Atlantic distances. They allowed us to build a network capable of transporting 99% of all the international communications on the planet. And that includes smartphones, by the way. They look wireless, but the cell towers to which they connect are plugged into the exact same internet network. Anyway, keep this number in mind for a minute. First, no, satellites are not a valid alternative, you slimy fool. They are useless on a global scale. They cost way more than a simple 25mm cable and have a much lower capacity. By some estimates, if the entire undersea network were to disappear tomorrow, all of the internet satellites orbiting the entire planet would have the capacity to handle 7% of the US international data, and that's it, no other countries allowed. So with cables that carry 99% of global international traffic, it would be silly and dumb and brain rotting 
to think that no one would ever want to sabotage them or do something really malicious with all of that juicy traffic flowing through them. Case in point, in oh my god, case in point, in November of 2024, two undersea cables, one connecting Finland to Germany and one connecting Lithuania to Sweden, were accidentally cut. The primary suspect is a Chinese fishing vessel. The very calm and collected German defense minister stated that no one believes that those cables were cut accidentally. And it's kind of hard to prove him wrong because of AIS. It's a globally adopted system that ships at sea utilize to identify themselves and provide their location to nearby ports. The ship that suspected of having cut those cables just turned off their AIS at around the time of the incidents. And the only sensible and regulated reason for which you are allowed to turn off your AIS is if you are at risk of being attacked by pirates. And the Baltic Sea isn't exactly known for piracy. In fact, there hasn't been a single piracy incident in that sea in the 21st century. But if it was intentional, what purpose did those cuts serve? I mean, the communications were rerouted through other cables, and there was only a minor increase in latency in the communications between the affected countries. Does it mean that it was a stupid as useless attack? Well, such outages could cause short but critical obstructions to some important services. Or they might just be used to study a target, to see what other connections they rely upon to handle the outage. This way, if you ever need to deal a significant blow to their communication infrastructure, you know just which cables to attack. So those small attacks can have big consequences, just like supporting me on this website here. Thank you! But cutting isn't the first idea I got when I thought about how I could use these cables for malicious purposes. There is so much potential in intercepting all of that thick, juicy traffic flowing through those cables and all you would have to do is somehow sneak a tiny little tap into the system and you'd get to eavesdrop on whatever you wanted. Several greasy government agencies around the world who get all aroused at the idea of spying on their citizens, the people that pay for their salaries, had the exact same idea. They realized the potential of accessing all the traffic, going through every single cable and got right to work. And before you make fun of me for my conspiracy hat, there is undeniable proof that the UK and the US both do it. The US had the Upstream program, an NSA program that allowed them to process all of the inbound traffic from a few landing stations. Landing stations are the buildings to which the undersea cables initially connect when reaching land. The UK has the very innocently named Mastering the Internet program, which entailed installing thousands of black boxes aka devices whose functionality is not entirely known to outside observers in crucial points of their country's internet backbone. What is known is that those boxes were at the very least capable of performing deep packet inspection, a technical term that refers to the ability to inspect the actual content and the destination of every single data packet traveling through the black box. They could use this analysis to store all of the packets that they deemed suspicious. I can't really make air quotes with all this in my hand. Now stop! I know there's some sneaky little smartass writing comments like, oh, but the data going through those cables is encrypted, so even if you could intercept it, it would be useless to you. Let's clear up a few things. It is true that nowadays most websites and services use encryption, which basically means that the moment your computer or phone needs to exchange data through the internet, the data is encoded with a secret cipher known only to you and to the recipient of your information. But there are still two tiny problems. First of all, if you don't take the appropriate steps needed to cover your tracks, anyone will still be able to see who you're sending your data to. So a malicious listener could, for example, see that right now someone in your house is requesting data packets from the nearest YouTube data center to stream this video. And they could also see your frequent visits to crazygooners.com. And second, let me introduce you to an idea known as Harvest Now, Decrypt Later. Quantum computers, they are a variation of traditional computers. To make it simple, let's just say that traditional computers are capable of reasoning using bits. Simple digits that can assume either the value of 0 or 1. If you implement a few basic operations like addition, comparison and a few other things, you can build an entire computer based on bits. Now, these often mentioned quantum computers have one thing that makes them truly special. See, quantum computing uses some stroke in using quantum physics to build qubits. The up version of traditional bits. 
These guys can assume the value of 0 or the value of 1, just like regular bits, or they can be in a condition called quantum superposition, which is as mysterious as your father's approval of you and your life choices. When in a superposition, the qubit's value is undetermined until you try to read it, at which point it either becomes 0 or 1. It's kind of like some Raid Shadow Legend loot box which has the sole purpose of getting children addicted to gambling. The one important positive aspect of this, though, is that even before we try to read the qubit's value, we can know the probability of either outcome. You can put a qubit in a state for which there is a 50% probability that a reading will come back as a 1 and a 50% probability that it will come up as 0. Or you can make it be 0 with 99.99% probability, like the amount of love your mother feels for you. But how does having a computer that's in a completely uncertain, unpredictable state help? Doesn't that defy the very principles of cold, hard logic and computation? Shouldn't programs be predictable? What's the benefit? Benefit of having a program that hallucinates the values of variables. If you ask yourself those questions, you are now, like me, a member of the Idiots Club. Most of the modern encryption used in communication is deemed safe because the act of cracking that encryption would mean solving some problems that are believed to be extremely hard to solve. And yes, I say believed and not known, because actually proving that such problems are really difficult is a problem of itself so difficult that there's a million dollar prize if you manage to solve it. And also it would be one of the biggest scientific discoveries of all time, I'm not joking. For example, finding all of the prime factors of a really big integer number is actually a very difficult problem. And its difficulty is the reason why one of the most widely adopted encryption algorithms is safe against attacks. Now, some very smart people figured out that you can use that quantum uncertainty from the qubits to build some algorithms that you couldn't build on classical computers. One such algorithm is Shor's algorithm. It can effectively find the prime factors of even the biggest integers in a very short amount of time, effectively enabling the possibility to break one of the most used encryption standards on the planet. But then why the f*** haven't we used this yet? Why is the world still functioning? Is it one of those stupid things that's doable in theory but impossible in practice? It's a utopia? No. No. We have actually mathematically proven that we can do it. Shor's algorithm works. But we need a powerful enough quantum computer to be able to run it. And we're not there yet. When are we going to get there? Nobody knows for sure, no one has a clue, but I can tell you something. Every single year, the number of qubits that we have managed to put into a quantum computer and hold in a stable state has kept increasing. And it's a trend that keeps accelerating. Just look at what Microsoft did like three days ago. As I was filming this, this just came out, which is an insane leap. I'm actually not even following the script anymore. It's just insane. It is crazy. You do not understand. I don't all of this crackhead daydreaming is nice and all, but to decode an encrypted message, you would have to intercept the message itself first. And no one can really sneak a little tap into an undersea cable without being detected. How? Why? I mean, how could they spot a cheeky, sneaky little rat in the middle of the f***ing ocean? It's all because the cables can somehow also be used as undersea microphones that detect all nearby activity. And using some other special technology that my TikTok brain couldn't really understand, there are systems that allow you to basically instantly detect any kind of disruption and they give you an approximate location of the disruption. They tell you how far away that disruption is along the length of the cable. This is a problem for saboteurs, because if you have to sneak a listening device into an undersea cable, you have to, at the very least, cut a portion of the cable to splice your listening device in place, and they would detect it immediately. And after they detect you, they're going to investigate the damage. And again, remember, because they can tell pretty much where the breakage happened, they will find your listening device and it will all be for nothing. The one possible way to install a wiretap and get away with it would be to do it during maintenance work, regularly scheduled interruptions of the line. Maybe by somehow controlling a company responsible for a huge chunk of the installations and maintenance operations of all of the undersea cables on the planet. But you could never get a single company to control and work on so many of the undersea cables. Huawei Marine. 
a division of the Chinese company Huawei, which as of 2020 had either installed or done maintenance work on 25% of all the undersea cables in the planet. On the planet. On. O-N. And governments around the world are a bit wary of that, especially since Chinese law basically allows the government to do whatever the f*** they want with any company that operates within their country. They could even, you know, get them to install a bunch of sneaky little wiretaps in every single cable they ever laid their dirty hands on. All of this is some good fun, but what even happens if you catch a little sneaky little fishing vessel sabotaging one of your precious f cables? No one knows! <laughs> no one! No one knows! <laughs> Agencies around the world disagree on what the response should be. Is cutting an undersea cable an act of war? Is it a minor disruption? Who enacts the punishment for cutting a cable that connects two different countries? And what if the cut has been performed in international waters? Who even holds jurisdiction there? Well, by definition, no one. So what do you do? There is no universal agreement currently in place to regulate all of this. <sighs> Primarily because of the consequences of cutting a cable. Most places could recover from a single cut, but some places would face more serious issues, because they don't have the needs for insanely high transfer speeds, and as such they are connected to the outside world only through a handful of cables. Some countries even use undersea cables to connect different parts of their own territories, and cutting one of those cables could be seen as a more targeted attack to a specific country. And while you might not completely cut a country from the internet, you might still cause significant outages, maybe cutting off people from services and information stored elsewhere, in, in a data center on the other side of the planet. But of these, the worst kind of sabotage is not clicking subscribe and not enabling notifications. Since the last big video, none of you came back. This is what happened. This is what happened with the latest video, okay? Genuinely, I would appreciate it if you just, you know, left a comment. Like, tell me why you hate bananas. I would also love if you checked out the Patreon, just, you know, read what's written on the page. It would be nice. And, and uh, we have a Discord server with over 150 people. And if this is the last time I see you, have a nice rest of your life.